Good evening, everybody. Okay, so we're going to talk about advocating for your child in the school system right across Canada. And unfortunately, this is a very sort of um, confusing um, topic because um, when we're dealing with all of the school systems across Canada, uh, they're all somewhat different. They've all got pros and cons um, and issues, but we're going to go through the first section tonight um, to hopefully explain all of that to you. And then in the next session, get more, delve more into how you can specifically advocate. So this is just a disclaimer slide, basically saying not to take this information as medical advice. It's for educational information only. So as I said tonight, we're gonna to be uh, covering the first four topics. Now, uh, this slide deck um, was designed for ADHD, but I'm told that many of your children also have issues with ADHD and executive functioning. Um, and I will try to change the wording somewhat, but if you've got uh, questions at the end, happy to answer all of those. So special education systems are under provincial mandate. And that's why we have this inconsistency across the country around special education and how kids with uh, special needs are serviced or recognized in the different provinces. So every province or territory has an education act which states that the government has a duty to provide uh, access to education. And it also specifically states that students with disability have rights to equal access to education. The wording's a little different for each province or territory, but basically that's what they say. So special education systems and funding models vary. So um, as how they recognize kids, but also how funding is provided to those students with exceptional needs. Generally, they're under two different uh, systems. One called inclusion, which is not exactly the same as the inclusive classroom, but I'll let be explaining that. And one called identification, which I'm going to explain more. So the provinces uh, generally in, in territories are moving towards systems of inclusion. There's various reasons uh, for that. It is actually um, the sort of thing right now uh, to have an inclusive classroom, but we also have to remember it's also a way to reduce um, costs to education systems to have a system of inclusion if it's not done correctly. Okay, so, and how these systems work um, in each province and territory has a significant impact on students with disabilities um, in general, and we're going to go be going into that. So, <coughs> these, uh, I'm first going to talk about the inclusion system. So, the inclusion system means there's no formal identification required for what the school boards call an exceptional learner, okay? Um, basically what happens is the Ministry of Education mandates the school boards who then mandate the principals to meet the needs of students with special education needs. It's not tied uh, to a specific diagnosis, although often that comes into the discussion as well. And as I said, it's not the same as inclusive education. So what is inclusive education generally means that all students, uh, regardless of their strengths, needs, um, their exceptional needs, are basically taught in a mainstream or community classroom. Um, the provinces and school boards are systematically reducing and getting away from 
smaller exceptional classrooms for students with special needs or withdrawal, that kind of thing. And there's a lot of talk about a term, which I'm sure you've heard called universal des design, which means it's a method of creating an environment, materials, a way of teaching to a wide variety of students with different physical and mental abilities. Um, so they can all succeed in the same environment. So that is the goal, that is the dream. We are far, far away from that yet, but that's what all of the boards and all of the ministries are talking about. And by the way, last year, I spoke with every ministry of education uh, in every province and ev every territory across Canada because we produced a report card it's a follow-up report card. We did another in 2010 where we graded all of them and as to how they recognized or did not recognize students with ADHD and the difficulties. I'll try to bring that up on the screen later if it works, but uh, we'll see. Okay, so the identification system is where a team or committee decides if a student meets the criteria very often it's, although they say it's not tied to a diagnosis, it's supposed to be tied to a level of need. Unfortunately, because the provinces uh, that still use this system have divided the disabilities into categories. And if a certain diagnosis of a student doesn't fit into a particular category, we're in trouble. And we're gonna get into that in a minute. So um, this recognition um, under a category in, in Ontario, the, the process is called IPRC, which stands for Identification Placement Review Committee. Terrible acronym, nobody can remember it unless you live and breathe this stuff. Uh, but that basically is a process that is gone through to officially identify a student. And when a student is identified, the right to special education resources stays with them to the end of their high school career. Post-secondary is a whole nother issue and we'll deal with that in the, the uh, second part of the presentation in a few uh, weeks. Uh, and also in some provinces, this recognition is tied to funding for the school. So if the child is deemed an exceptional student, funding will flow to the school. Uh, but the provinces are more and more uh, moving away from that. And we'll talk about that as well. So these systems have both benefits and drawbacks, right? The, the negative to both of them is if the school waits, uses a, what we call a wait to fail a, approach. So they really need to see the child struggling. Some boards talk about being academically behind for two years, all these kind of things. Again, there's no consistency in this, but um, we frequently have issues if the, <coughs> sorry, if the kids are doing okay, uh, they're not failing, but unfortunately we may have very, very bright students who are getting, you know, B, C's kind of thing. They're not working to potential, but they're not failing. Unfortunately, um, it, that makes it more difficult to advocate for them to get special education resources. And as I said, this identification system can also be used to block students with ADHD, but also students who are not recognized under specific categories. And each province has different categories. In Ontario, it's five categories. ADHD does not fit under any of them. Uh, I don't believe uh, hydrocephalus fits under any of them um, either. So the struggle to get an IPRC de designation is very difficult. You may be able to get an IEP. You may, you may not. Ontario's a mess right now with very little consistency. 
So the other difficulty with the inclusion system is um, if there is not direct documentation identifying a student, um, it's a little harder to secure their rights for special education resources. And IPRC has legal things attached to it and IEP becomes a legal must. Uh, it doesn't mean you don't have to continue at, continually advocate, but you've got that documentation there that makes it easier um, to fight and your, your, your child's rights are actually mandated. Our biggest issue right across Canada, and I'm sure you have exactly the same issue um, with, for the students with hydrocephalus is educators are not trained in the impairments that they will typically see in these kids. And they're also not trained into ha uh, how to teach teaching strategies, accommodation supports that they can put in um, for these um, kids. That is our biggest problem. Well, in ADHD, very often the kids are still seen or identified or thought of as being behavioral problems, or especially if they have problems with executive functioning, organization skills, time management, problem solving, all of those things we, we see in ADHD. And apparently you also see in some of your kids um, if teachers do not understand those uh, impairments or difficulties, they frequently think the child is just not trying hard enough, they're lazy, they're not motivated, et cetera, et cetera, which is not the case at all. So the systems do have some positive, as I said, identification can secure rights. The inclusion model can lead to services uh, faster because they don't have to go through the system, but it really all depends on the details and how these things are implemented from board to board and school to school, which makes a huge difference. We find that um, for our students with ADHD, what makes the biggest difference is if the principal gets or has been trained in ADHD and if the teacher has, because then they will understand it and understand it as a legit, legitimate medical disability. So some of the provinces, and, and I'll just go over some of this um, quickly. So systems of identification, um, Quebec, Ontario, Newfoundland, and Saskatchewan um, all have systems of identification, but Newfoundland and Saskatchewan recognize ADHD under a category. I do not know um, how that applies for hydrocephalus. Now, many of them do have categories um, medical categories. So you may be able to get it recognized under there. Quebec and Ontario, not so much so. So Ontario doesn't tie funding to the codes. It generally um, gives chunks of funding to boards and a portion of that goes to special education. And there is additional funding for kids with severe disabilities. Uh, Quebec, again, lack of recognition um, of a lot of the disorder. So if you're dealing with a child with a disorder that's in a category, much easier. BC is transitioning. BC has been transitioning for literally five years now. <laughs> so, uh, but again, um, there was a change of government and then um, Obviously, there was COVID. They decided to totally relook at their education system and how they funded it, which meant they totally looked up at the special education system. They are moving. They promised me they're still doing this, moving to a system of inclusion because BC was one of our biggest issues. I mean, Ontario still is, but 
because they directly tied the funding of the schools to the kids being identified under a category. So the schools were not getting additional funding for kids with impairments that were not, not recognized under a category. Alberta is mostly transitioned. Uh, they're still using some codes um, to sort of collect data on special education planning per se. There's a link there. Um, ADHD is recognized under a physical or medical disability, under a neurological uh, condition, and I would guess that hydrocephalus would be as well. But again, that's something you can use that link to and look into. Um, the others have systems of inclusion. New Brunswick is a really interesting uh, test case. And actually in our report card of the provinces of 2010, we actually said that, okay, moving to a system of inclusion in theory sounds wonderful, but if it is done, so all of the kids with exceptional needs are put in a regular community classroom, if that is done, with not reducing class size, putting in more E's, uh, EAs, uh, training the teachers, um, all of that support, we're going to have a huge issue. And New Brunswick is a per perfect example of that. So they totally moved to the system of inclusion or the, the uh, to them, it was the inclusive classroom they moved to. They did not put any of those additional supports in. It's called, called policy 322. They can't even use this, the, the term <coughs> special needs. <coughs> so uh, basically uh, a couple of years ago, they started re-looking at this because they were having burnt out teachers, complaints of, uh, you know, um, violent episodes in the class. Um, the parents of kids with special needs were saying their needs weren't met. Even the parents of kids without special needs were complaining it was a mess. So they said they're not gonna move away from the system of inclusion, but they totally have to relook at what they're doing. Some of the other territories and provinces, as they've moved into these systems of inclusion. Some of them have had it for a while. Some issues have propped up. So Yukon, for example, has removed IEPs, individual education plans, placed all students under what they call SL, SLPs, unless they don't expect that student to graduate high school. The difficulty is IEPs are considered a legal document with legal rights. Um, they need to be implemented and you can fight for that. SLPs, who knows, right? Nova Scotia has IPPSs and, and each province has a different term, right? IPPs, IEPs, ISSPs, there's all kinds of different terms. They all basically mean an individual education a plan. They're just different acronyms. So they say they will no only implement it if they recognize academic issues. And remember that point I said when, you know, if they're looking for the child to be significantly academically behind, the difficulty is if we have bright students who should be getting all, you know, A's and B's and are not failing, they're not working to their potential and they have the right to special education resources. Uh, Manitoba, um, is actually um, doing quite well. Uh, we didn't have too many issues when we looked at them and graded them. Um, same with Nunavut, uh, Northwest Territories. Um, and again, the Northwest Territories are only putting IEPs in if there are significant changes to the child, the way the child is taught and learns. Otherwise, they put SSPs in place. And again, we don't know the, the legal uh, 
ramifications around SSPs. So um, BC, um, I basically said is transitioning. Um, so um, they again are transitioning to a system of inclusion which means all of the categories are taken away. They have said that uh, ADHD is going to be uh, recognized, but my point to them and my point to the Ministry of Education in BC is, uh, okay, you have had a system in place for several decades where you did not recognize some of the students as having disabilities who were not under your categories. Just by transitioning to a system of inclusion does not mean your teachers are automatically going to change their mindset because what we find with educators is if that specific disability or diagnosis or whatever you want to call it, <coughs> sorry, is not under a category, teachers tend to view it as not really being a serious disability or causing many educational exceptional needs. They, they really kind of don't take it seriously. And hence the teachers aren't trained in appropriate teaching strategies and accommodations for those kids. So our point to BC is, it's all very well and good to simply transition but you need to give your educators a strong message that all kids with a disability have the human right to have access to equal access to education and your, your educators need to be educated um, on these things. Um, okay, so um, in Ontario, we actually, um, we've done a lot of advocacy um, around um, these categories and uh, students not getting recognized under them. And so in 2011, our Ministry of Education came out with a memorandum, which basically stated that students with ADHD and, and it listed a whole uh, lot of other disorders but it said that list was not all inclusive. So um, I'm sure hydrocephalus would fit under that as well. But it basically said a, the student did not have to fit under a direct category to have the right to get an IPRC. It's supposed to be um, based on their level of need, right? They need to display a learning need. Um, and it specifically said students don't have to have a learning disability because that's basically the schools were basically saying if the student with ADHD or another disorder did, that did not fit under category was not diagnosed as having a learning disability, which is a specific impairment, they didn't have a right to the IPRC um, and an IEP. Now they they are putting some IEPs in place for, uh, for kids, but it, it's totally inconsistent. So we will have two students, uh, same diagnosis, very, very simil similar uh, impairments in two different boards within 10 miles of each other and receiving totally different levels of uh, support, which is crazy, right? But that's, where it kind of is right now. So the memorandum ha has made some of a difference. Some of the school boards have actually um, taken it to heart. Um, they have uh, our uh, IPRC more kids, but generally school boards don't like to go through this identification process. It's time, it's money, it's more paperwork, it's, uh, they basically don't like doing it. I personally feel they also don't like doing it because there is a way, a, a way to hold them more accountable. Once you have that paperwork, an IEP becomes a legal must. 
if the student is not IPRC'd, an IEP is totally at a school's discretion uh, to put it in place. But what we also find is also at their discretion to take it away. And we have found some school boards, um, and some of them actually have policies on this, um, where they say, if the student is not officially identified, once they get into grade nine, into high school, their IEP is removed, they're taken um, out away from special education, put into guidance, and of course, guidance teachers are not um, training in, in, in these disorders at all, right? So again, we're getting total inconsistency and these kids' human rights not being um, met. So actually the Ontario Human Rights Commission, and there's links there, and um, I'm happy for you to get copies of these slides so you can um, go to these links, but also everything is on our website as well. But they actually wrote a document in 2018 that, that said um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission recognizes, and they specifically said ADHD as a disability because they had been getting so many complaints, but, but it is also a fabulous document on the rights of students with any disability. So it said, says education providers have a legal duty to accommodate the disability related needs of students to the point of undue hardship, which is um, a pretty strong statement because if that board doesn't have the resource, they actually have to purchase it from a neighboring board. So uh, it also says it, it, the ministry um, has a legal duty regardless of whether the student is IPRC or fits under those categories or not. And it also states the, Onto on the Ontario Human Rights Code prevails or supersedes any ministry or school board, right? And, and boards need to follow the guidelines or they open themselves up to litigation. The difficulty is the litigation part because it is very onerous to go through an Ontario human rights um, case. To date, they've all been settled in mediation. I was involved in, uh, in one that went on for a number of years and they will do everything and anything so it doesn't go to a hearing because once it goes to a hearing, you can talk about it in the media and it becomes a precedent setting case and we don't have one of those yet. So <coughs> I talked a lot about little, very little consistency or equity um, across Ontario, but also from province to province, right? Or in territory, right? And as you can see with this wide variety of systems, how they're implemented, all the different terminology um, that's used, um, there is very little consistency. One of the reasons we developed our report card and after I get to the end of the presentation, I'll stop share and try to share the report card because that is an excellent resource for you um, and it, talks about every province. Now, focuses in on ADHD, but um, a lot of the, the issues will be exactly the same. So uh, again, little consistency, um, little training for educators. Um, and since principals are mandated to meet the needs, they also have to be educated about these disabilities because a lot of times for our kids um, the principals and the teachers just see them as disrespectful or they're not trying hard enough because they don't understand ADHD and I'm assuming they don't understand hydrocephalus either they don't see a learning need right they don't see um, impairments they see a student who they are interpreting as being a behavior problem, or sometimes they interpret them as not being too bright when 
maybe the total opposite is the case, right? Um, okay, we talked about the categories. Um, oh, and the other issue with this inconsistency is school boards, um, and really this is right across the country and I, we've been directly told this is the issue in Ontario as well. School boards al are allowed to sort of set the level of impairment that they see the student as being impaired enough to have the right for special education resources. And that's where we get into big issues, even when trying to get an IEP. Um, and that's what I encourage parents to do is to develop their child's profile. We have a, a parenting course, actually that's going on right now where I uh, teach parents all about ADHD and the, the um, common impairments we see with uh, obviously attention regulation, but executive functioning, self-regulation, emotional regulation, all the things that hit these kids um, in school and how to develop an accurate um, profile for their kids. Because if we are dealing with knowledge on only some of their weaknesses and impairments and we don't have a very thorough picture, um, then we are often spinning our wheels and trying to support um, these kids. So I often encourage parents to collect all of the information that they can, the medical reports, all of that, but also examples of, um, you know, their child's work. Um, do a log on how long does it take to do homework? Do you have to be with that child and sit with that child to get homework done, you need to have evidence of how they are struggling um, and what additional support you're giving them at home so they're not, quote, failing in the school system. Uh, I'm not going to deal with this much, but uh, basically DSM-5 stands for Diagnostic Statistical Manual as the Bible of the people who deal with um, any mental health disorders, psychiatric disorders, but also defines learning disabilities and all that. And ADHD used to be under the category of behavior disorder, which uh, when I teach um, teachers in training about this, I said, open your textbook and what's the, the title of your chapter? And I said, okay, that is gonna imprint that term in your mind <laughs> for the rest of your teaching career that kids with ADHD are behavior disorders. So in 2013, it was changed under the neurodevelopmental category, which it should be is, and that is also the category where autism and learning disabilities and Tourette syndrome and any other neurodevelopmental um, disorder sits, sit. So that was a, a good thing for us and helped us in our advocacy work. What I find um, with some uh, parents, and you may have less of this, or I don't know, um, maybe you guys need to tell me that, but we have, uh, we run into parents quite often who have this fear of labeling. So they don't want to go through the IPRC process. They don't want to share with the school the diagnosis of their child or how their child is struggling or medical reports, all of those kind of things because they don't want their child labeled, right? My message to them usually is if your child is struggling, struggling academically, socially, or behaviorally, um, believe me, they are already labeled in the minds of every educator in that school, uh, every peer in their class, and every parent of their peer. Unfortunately, they're usually labeled with incorrect labels, like, you know, they're stupid, they're lazy, they're bad, et cetera, et cetera. So my message to parents is, would you not rather have the correct medical label, which will at least start to open the door on advocating for your child? 
So individual education plans, which I've talked to, I've talked about quite a bit. So that's the list of the different terms that are out there and being used. It all pretty much uh, means the same thing. But know that as parents, you have a right to be involved in developing the individual education plan, right? You have the right to be involved in the placement decision. Ashley, it's, it's hard for a school board to put um, a student in a specific placement decision, either a you know, special class, uh, regular class, whatever, um, without the parent's input. I mean, a regular class is fine, the student will be there, but if they're suggesting anything else, you have direct uh, rights to have input in that. And you also have rights to, in the developing uh, of the IEP, and I'm gonna show you some charts, which um, are specific for ADHD and executive functioning, but I'm sure uh, there is an awful lot of overlap, okay? Um, and my message to parents is, uh, if you're given a copy of an IEP, usually it's sometime in October, if the school were, are, following the timelines they should be. If you do not like the content in there or you do not understand what they have listed for teaching strategies and accommodation, very often they'll use one or two word terms, things like repetition, uh, chunking, um, all of those kind of things that parents don't necessarily understand, right? Because they're educational terms. Get them to explain it to you. And also, if you understand what they're supposed to be doing or say they're supposed to be doing, you can hold the teacher and the school accountable. Because what I suggest is parents meet every couple of months, take the IEP in and say, Okay, so how are these accommodations working? Are they working? Um, can you give an example of how you have implemented this? If you get kind of a blank stare from the teacher, you know it hasn't been implemented. And we find this a lot. So again, it's your role to um, call those meetings and advocate for your child to make sure those sometimes beautifully written IEPs that are never implemented because they're of no use, right? If they're not implemented. So the goal of an IEP is to assist the student or child to be successful at school. It generally lists the child's unique strengths and needs. And you also, you want the teacher to know about your child's strengths um, as well. Uh, what's if there's specific educational uh, goals, um, but remember an IEP should be what we call a living document. So it should be um, reviewed minimum, minimum of once a year, but I really suggest it's reviewed more often than that between the teacher and the parent and then officially re, uh, reviewed maybe end of year before it goes to the next year. Because the point of an IEP is that it should be altered regularly and approved upon regularly. When, and, and it's moved from one teacher to the teacher next year. So that teacher can understand what are the strategies and accommodations that work best. So we can start with some strategies and accommodations, what we think will work, but that not necessarily won't work. All our kids are very individualized and they have very individual needs. Well, because of that, the accommodations that will work will also be very individualized. <coughs> and remember an IEP is a legal document. So it, you have the right to demand that it is implemented. So uh, also then IEP will state the placement decision. Is the student going to be in a regular class, um, have 
part day withdrawal? Uh, is support going to come into that regular class or float through that regular class? Or are they going to be in a special education class? Um, and the, the terms they use depends on the province um, as well. It, it uh, should always state whether the curriculum is being modified. I'll tell you about that in a minute. It should list the accommodations and if there's any exemptions. Some kids who have significant language uh, issues can be exempted, exempted from French sometimes. So uh, what you need to be aware of is the term. So terms can change from accommodation to adaptation uh, from province to province or territory. That basically means the environment um, is changed. So if the child has the accommodation that they can go to a quiet place to write exams, if they have uh, a cubby that they can go to to get quiet when they're working, if they sit at the front of the class with the teacher, those are all environmental changes. Also, uh, teaching process. If the teacher is changing how they're working with the child or teaching the child or helping them chunk their work, time manage their work, all that kind of thing, that's, um, you know, the uh, adaptation of teaching. And then there can be the accommodation or adaptation on how the child is um, tested, right? Or evaluated. So those are the three general uh, terms. Your ears, your red flag needs to pop up if you hear the term modification, which generally means the student is not being taught and the work they're doing is not at their grade level. So the curriculum has been altered and you need to get in there ASAP, figure out what they're modifying. If your child is not working at grade level, uh, is it is only specific subjects? Is it all the subjects? It is a, um, it, are there, uh, <coughs> sorry, is there modification around the expectations in social skills or self-regulation? You need to find that out because we've had kids sometimes who get into high school, they've been on a modif modification and they're on tracks not to graduate high school and parents have no idea, right? So again, you have to pay attention to, to these terms. Those are the three different um, accommodations grouping I talked about, instructional, uh, environmental, or assessment. There's a link there that um, breaks them up and, and lists all kinds of different instructional accommodations, et cetera. You can see that on the CADAP website. So uh, just to finish off, these are some tools we developed um, and there's links to them there, but I'm going to show you some uh, examples of them. So this is the first page of a um, document we did on teaching strategies that are typical for ADHD or executive functioning impairments. And you'll see that on the left hand side. Uh, it um, highlights a particular impairment or weakness or a thing that the student may be struggling with in the classroom. And on the right hand side, it gives you a list of appropriate teaching strategies and accommodations for that issue. And you'll notice there's a great long list now. This is only page one. Um, there are uh, 28 different impairments. So this is a multi-page document. You can access it on the website. Uh, the links are here on this slide, uh, but they're easy to find on the website. Just look under um, ADHD um, information or understanding ADHD general in education and you'll get 
all of these documents, links to the memorandum, links to everything um, is there. So, and the reason that there's a, such an extensive list, remember I said accommodations are very individual as to what will work or not. So again, uh, we have to choose what works best and possibly alter it um, and to tweak it to get, you know, the ultimate uh, IEP. So this is a um, chart that has actually linked and the reason we did this is um, very often schools will question, you know, the legitimacy of ADHD symptoms and diagnosis and all that. So this is all linked medically. Uh, the reasons for this to the DSM symptom that's listed in the DSM. It, it talks about possible uh, impairments in elementary school and possible accommodations. It's done as a checklist. So you can sit down with your teacher or your medical professional. And even if your, chi your child, if they're old enough and use it sort of as a tip sheet, obviously you would change some of the language, but you can say, you know, do you have difficulty staying focused when the teacher's teaching, right? And just get them to describe that to you. I, it's difficult. Our kids often are not really big sharers and it may take a number of attempts. But again, these are great um, to track different things that come up. And then they're also great to help in your input for an IEP. And you have the right to say, my understanding is my child is significantly struggling with this, and this is the accommodation I want you to start with, and then we'll review in two months, okay? Again, we, and we have one for elementary, one for high school, and one for post-secondary. And again, these are uh, numerous page documents. I'm just showing you the first page. So um, they're a great resource to use. So I'm going to start, stop there. Um, I just ask that you send it out as a PDF. Sure. Um, and all the copyrights are on that. And, um, you know, I just ask parents, please, everything is under what we call a Creative Commons copyright as well. But Certainly. it's for your dual use, don't kind of share it far and wide kind of um, thing per se, but especially, yeah, people like to review them. Um, also, there are webinars on a lot of these different topics <coughs> on the website. So there's one specifically under uh, on executive functioning in detail and how ADHD impacts kids learning and how executive functioning impacts kids learning and all. So there's tons of resources on the website. And I think a lot of the, the information would apply to um, your children as well. Absolutely. There's a lot of uh, commonalities for sure. And um, Hydrocephalus Canada also has resources on um, navigating the uh, school system um, that we can forward all they all anyone on the, the session has to do is um, send us an email and we can get that out to you I see a question here so let me just okay Sally is asking do you need a psychoeducational assessment if you are on an IEP already with the school no so actually um <laughs> This is a fight we actually had with university, universities and colleges across um, Canada. Uh, and again, it's um, a lot of uh, elementary and high schools think that psychoeducational assessments are sort of the gold standard. They're not. Actually, for ADHD, they are uh, frequently inaccurate. The only reason you would... Um, have a psychoeducational assessment done. And by the way, they're usually or going rate right these days are about $4,000, 3,500 to 4,000, uh, is if you uh, have a strong suspicion that your child may have a learning disability. 
along with um, hydrocephalus or I, I mean, uh, or ADHD or, or whatever. Um, psychoeducational assessments, unfortunately, are not accurate for executive functioning. And we find that schools, um, because they were never designed to be, right? Uh, psychoeducational assessments are primarily to diagnose a learning disability or brain trauma. So again, if you are dealing with those two issues, then yes, they are helpful to understand your child's learning profile, their strengths, their needs, where they may be struggling. Uh, and if you can get a diagnosis of a learning disability, and again, it sounds ridiculous to want your child to have another disorder, but if they're diagnosed with a learning disability, you may find advocating in the school system easier because the learning yes. disabilities are always, always recognized under the categories. Yeah, I know many in, um, in our community um, can access neuropsychological assessments through the Children's Treatment Center um, if their child has spina bifida and hydrocephalus. And for hydrocephalus, generally speaking, their neurosurgeon can connect them with a psychologist that can also do a, a neuropsychological assessment if a learning disability is um, suspected. So what I would recommend, though, whoever you, you're looking at for doing the testing, have a discussion with them before. Uh, make sure they understand executive functioning impairments and the impairments that they typically would see with kids, you know, with, with uh, the diagnosis your kids have, and that they know the appropriate language to advocate in school systems because the difficulty is you can have the psychoeducational testing done it can come back that your child is in the normal level for executive functioning because these tests are not accurate even if the child is struggling daily in their executive functioning we still get them in the normal range because psychoeducational testing is done in the perfect environment it's one-on-one -on -one with a tester. It's a quiet classroom. The child can uh, ask for clarification. You know, the tester can prompt them. That's not a classroom environment, right? Where they're struggling um, every day. But the schools will then take that report and say, no, no, your kid's in the normal range. We do not have to give them any resources um, at all. And the language in the report, and actually, I shouldn't be telling you all this because it, it's actually in the next session, but if the um, psychologist says um, the child should have da 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 da, da you know, uh, because they have difficulty in this and this, the school can can throw in the garbage, it, you know. But if the wording says it is essential for the student to have X, Y, and Z to be able to access the curriculum, they can't get out of that wording. So it's very important, your psychologist, if you're gonna pay $4,000 for this, is very knowledgeable on how to write these reports correctly. Okay, and I do know as well that um, schools often offer these um, assessments, would you recommend going with a school assessment or an outside assessment? Um, yes, I wouldn't say often. Generally, there is a two to three year wait list. Um, they will um, rank the students as to severity, and then your child may constantly get bumped to the bottom of the line. The other thing, if the school does the assessment, they own the report. If you do the assessment, depending on what it says, it's your choice to share it with the school or not, right? So if the report you think is not gonna be helpful or detrimental to your child getting what they need in the school system, it's up to you whether you wanna share it. If it's the schools, they own it, to the end of your child's 
uh, high school career and it stays in their uh, student record and that's it, right? Because they paid for it. So unfortunately, it's really expensive. If you do have um, some private health care, uh, many psychologists will uh, divide it uh, under the parents and the child because they do have to spend time with the parents as well with questionnaires and evaluating all that kind of stuff. And also, if you know when the cutoff is, so most uh, of them change to a new calendar year in December, some plans in September, you can cross those two. So you can do some testing in December and just some in January, and then pool two years of your private health care, which, which will help significantly. Very good tips. Thank you so much, Heidi. So I think we'll wrap up tonight's session. Um, please remember that Heidi will, will be back on May 5th to continue discussing IEPs and advocating in the school system and much more. So um, if you enjoyed this session, please don't forget to register for the second part of this webinar series. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Heidi, for your presentation and um, we will see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>